This person sent this in and they couldn't be here for the weekend. They're actually in Japan, but they sent this text and they said, I bought weekend passes because I really believe in this event. So this person bought weekend passes and is giving it to a friend to use. Uh, she said, I, I bought weekend passes because I really believe this event. I want to support it. Uh, have a good conference. Let's change the world. Thanks, Bill Nye. So yeah, so we have Bill Nye's official imprimatur on the event, which is lovely. Okay, uh, moving on to our next speaker. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm working like, like the Dickens to pronounce this correctly. Okay, ready? I've been practicing. So uh, our next speaker's name is God Sahad. Is that close? Is that close? Sahad. Sahad. There's a, there's a little, little thing you have to do. So God Sahad is our next speaker. Um, his uh, talent or skill that he would like to have instantly would be the ability to permanently move to South California. <laughs> the thing he would rescue out of his burning house is a copy of The Origin of Species. Yeah, fantastic. He is the first person who has said that ninjas will beat pirates in a fight. He specified, though, they have to be non-PC ninjas. I'm not sure what that means, but I want to watch that fight. Uh, and finally, uh, between cake or pie, he said unequivocally, dark chocolate cake. Yes, so his talk is called Departures from Reason When Ideology Trumps Science. Please welcome God Saad. So is, is this good? Can you hear me well if I speak like this? Yes. Um, so let me, let me say how you supposed to properly pronounce it, notwithstanding the very nice effort. Uh, it's Gad, it's a Hebrew name, and Sa'ad, it's a guttural ayin. But of course, typically people who don't speak Arabic or Hebrew, you just extend the A, it becomes sad. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so thank please, please call me God. You probably thought that God was taller, but apparently I... I come in smaller packages, but maybe larger packages this way. Uh, Could someone you. please make a God sad meme? Just whatever that would be. Just it's got to be something. Just, there are already a lot of are... memes of me on the internet. Oh, fantastic. Okay, cool. Don't add cool. to it. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for having me here. It's the first time that I am at this type of meeting, so I'm uh, very, very happy to be here. And I also want to thank you for having rescued me from the shackles of the winter in Montreal. And so... <laughs> If I wasn't able to make it to all the talks this morning, uh, it's because I was trying to bask in the sun for, if only for an hour or two, before I go back to my dark reality in Montreal. <laughs> so today I'm going to take you on a sort of journey of how we apply specific tools of science to help us bust some ideological positions. But prior to doing so, I sort of want to give you a bit of a background so there are really two great threats uh, that historically have faced humanity. One of them are actual biological pathogens, things like cholera and tuberculosis and bubonic plague, other viruses, malaria as a parasite. So all of these are biological pathogens. But of course, there are also metaphorical pathogens. Those are viruses of the human mind, ideas, beliefs, attitudes, and mindsets that parasitize our minds. and make us depart from using reason, logic, and science to get to a veridical position. And so I will, as I said, show you how we use certain tools of science, certain epistemological tools, to help us bust some ideological positions. Before I do that, let me continue with some biological uh, analogies. So here we've got the spider wasp. If you see the leftmost top uh, uh, image, the spider wasp looks for a much larger spider, it then injects it with a sting that then renders the spider a zombie. It carries it to its burrow, lays its eggs on the spider in vivo, and then the offspring will eat this packet of energy in vivo. Now, why am I talking about this? I argue, I analogize this very creepy phenomenon to political correctness. Polit pol political correctness is the spider wasp's sting. It parasitizes us from otherwise saying things that are as obvious as the existence of gravity, and then slowly we are led to the abyss of infinite darkness. <laughs> There's also a brain worm. Uh, so if you look at the next one on the top right, in this case, it is afflicting a wildebeest. 
when the wildebeest is afflicted with this brain worm, it starts going around in small circles forevermore as the looming predators approach it, and it can't extricate itself from this circular movement until its eventual demise. And then some of you may have heard of uh, Toxoplasma gondii, which is another parasite. So for example, when it afflicts mice, then the mice lose their innate adaptive fear of cats. And so there are all sorts of contexts where you have these parasites of the mind that result in maladaptive dire consequences. To give you yet another example, here we've got a lady who is suffering from anorexia nervosa and eating disorder. And when this woman looks at herself in the mirror, despite the fact that she is completely emaciated, despite the fact that at this point she probably weighs around 60 to 70 pounds, when she looks at herself, her cognitive disordered mindset is such that she actually sees herself as being grossly overweight and maybe I need to lose more weight. So it's not just sort of an abstract idea that we have these parasites that take over our brains, it really can lead to all sorts of dire consequences. So I've come up with a new disease, which I call ostrich parasitic syndrome, <laughs> or OPS for short. And that really comes from my having engaged both fellow scientists and the public on a whole wide range of issues. And I see them repeatedly succumbing to the same types of disordered thinking, and so I put these under one rubric called OPS. So let me read to you what OPS is. Uh, the reason I put it in quotes, these are my words, they come from one of my sad truth clips. For those of you who might be interested, I have a YouTube channel. You can go and check it out. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so let me just read it out for you very quickly. So this disorder causes a person to reject realities that are otherwise as clear as the existence of gravity. Sufferers of OPS do not believe their lying eyes they construct an alternate reality known as unicornia. In, in such a world, science, reason, rules of causality, evidentiary thresholds, a near infinite amount of data, data analytic procedures, inferential statistics, the epistemological rules inherent to the scientific method, rules of logic, historical patterns, daily patterns, and common sense are all rejected. Instead, the delusional ramblings of an OPS sufferer are rooted in illusory correlations, non-existent causal links, and feel-good progressive platitudes. Ostrich logic is always delivered via an air of haughty moral superiority. Let me give you some examples of manifestations of OPS and related mind viruses in academia. So postmodernism is, is very much of an anti-science movement. It basically says that science is just one of many ways of knowing. All is relative. There are no universals other than the one universal that there are no universals. Uh, it results in an endless, random, nonsensical gibberish that masquerades as profundity, but it means nothing. And the typical uh, gurus of this movement are the French postmodernists, such as Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, and Jacques Lacan. So if you try to read that stuff and don't understand it, don't go inwards and think it's because you're too dumb. It's because it truly is random gibberish. <laughs> Why do I mention this as being a mind virus? Because it has literally parasitized the brains of several generations of students who could have actually been studying things of value, and instead they've gone down this path that ultimately is profoundly anti-science. Radical fem feminism as, so equity feminism, the idea that men and women should be treated equally under law, of course, all of us in this room would agree with. The problem with radical feminism is it also espouses positions that are very much anti-science. So the idea, for example, that they reject sexual dimorphism as a reality of homo sapiens, that there are innate evolutionary-based sex differences, is nonsensical, right? On the other hand, they will argue, which leads us to the third mind virus, from a, can you go? They will argue from a social constructivist perspective that everything that we are is due ultimately. We're born with empty slate, tabula rasa, and then it's only socialization that makes us who we end up becoming. Now, of course, evolutionists don't deny the fact that socialization is important. But first, they recognize that there are also biological blueprints that we come equipped to the world with. And socialization doesn't exist as something antithetical to biology. 
Socialization exists in its form because of biology. Okay? Cultural and moral relativism is another one of those outlandish movements that started in academia. Cultural relativists basically argue that there are no human universals, nothing. There is nothing that you could, there's nothing that you could hang on the mantle of human universals. Everything is culturally relative. Okay? And that's simply not true. As an evolutionary behavioral scientist, I can count a very broad range of human universals that happen in exactly the same way across widely different cultures. As a matter of fact, there's a great book by an anthropologist named Donald Brown called Human Universals, where he catalogs a bunch of these universals. Uh, these types of movements then result in all sorts of act activism-based movements in academia, such as political correctness, the thought police, the language police, social justice warriors, uh, the culture of perpetual offense, the culture of victimology, right? the oppression Olympics, identity politics. All of these things care a lot more about feelings than about facts. right? If there is a fact that hurts somebody's feelings, then it's best that you keep your mouth shut because you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. All of these constitute part of what I call mind viruses that are polluting uh, the integrity of academia. What are some of the nefarious consequences of some of these academic mind viruses? I'll just go through a few. By the way, this is really an outline, not to plug, but uh, of what looks like my next book is going to be about. And so you're, get, you're getting a bit of a preview of what's to come hopefully in the next year or so. So academics will avoid so-called forbidden topics such as tackling sex differences or race differences because to do so, it becomes very easy for you to be tarred with the appellation of you're a racist, you're a sexist. So, so you will specifically avoid certain topics because they are forbidden. They're part of the pantheon of forbidden knowledge. Professors are bullied into using nonsensical gender pronouns when addressing students to avoid committing a hate crime. So this is right now in Canada. We have Canada's Bill C-16. Uh, someone who's become a good friend of mine, Jordan Peterson, a professor of psychology at University of Toronto, uh, came on my show recently. He's gotten an, into all sorts of trouble because he said that I'm unwilling. The government cannot force me to use nonsensical words that are not part of the uh, lexicon of English uh, when addressing a student. You can't approach me and say, I want to be addressed as they or xir or gz and so on. Okay? <laughs> but apparently now we're heading towards this becoming a hate crime because you're attacking a marginalized group. <laughs> University students demand protection from countering ideas whilst being coddled and infantilized by administrators, right? Don't wear this, uh, this cost Halloween costume or that one because it's going to be cultural appropriation because you're going to be a racist bigot. Politicians are deathly fearful of criticizing, shh, I won't say the name, shh, or open border immigration policies, for to do so would imply that they are toothless, redneck, racist bigots. People are deathly afraid to espouse any politically incorrect position, try being a conservative Republican in Hollywood or a Trump supporter in academia. Now, some of you might say, well, what's wrong with that? Any, any, any sensible person would have to hate Trump. No, that's not the point. Then, then we need to speak later. That's, the point is you allow people the opportunity to express their opinions and then let your ideas defeat them. But you don't shut down people uh, because it offends you, because it triggers you, because you need a safe space. So my own scientific journey, so now to tie it to some of the realities that I have faced. So in founding the field of evolutionary consumption, some of you may not know what evolutionary consumption is, it's basically the idea of applying evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology to study consumer behavior. But I define consumer behavior very broadly. It's not just the consumption of uh, Starbucks and Coca-Cola. We consume religious narratives. We consume uh, re uh, literary narratives. We consume friendships. We consume marriages. And so I really define consumption in a very broad sense. And then I look at the biological underpinnings of these consumatory realities. And so in Developing this field, my natural science colleagues were totally on board. Yeah, no kidding. Sure, of course we're biological beings. My social science colleagues were, what the hell is this guy talking about? What makes us human is that we transcend our biology, according to them. 
What makes us human different from the mosquito and the zebra is that we're not shaped by these biological imperatives. Okay? Some of the common canards that I have faced in developing the field, I'll, I don't know why it came out as 1111. It's on my thing, it was 1234. Sorry for that. Uh, the first one, as I said, biological instincts and drives might be applicable when explaining the behaviors of animals. However, humans are first and foremost cultural beings. This is known as the human reticence effect, right? So if you use an evolutionary principle to explain the mating behavior of the salamander, great research. If you use the exact same methodology, theory, epistemology to explain the mating behavior of a human, well, surely you must be a Nazi, right? <laughs> and that, that, by the way, comes oftentimes from evolutionary biologists who will readily accept that, of course, evolution is correct. They will fully accept that evolution might explain everything about humans, but mysteriously evolution stops at the neck. When it comes to the brain, there must be some other magical process. It certainly can't be evolutionary psychology. So even sophisticated evolutionary biologists could be parasitized by stupidity. <laughs> Number two, evolutionary psychology is morally dangerous in that it provides explanations for reprehensible actions such as adultery, rape, and child abuse. This you often hear. Evolutionary psychologists care about simply understanding human nature. Part of the repertoire of human nature is that humans do a lot of bad things. They cheat on their partners, they rape, they, com they, engage, they commit child abuse. To explain these realities from a scientific or evolutionary perspective doesn't mean that you condone it. It doesn't mean that you're justifying it. And usually the example that I give as a rebuttal to that is I'll say, well, if that logic is right, then an oncologist who studies pancreatic cancer is for pancreatic cancer, is justifying and condoning pancreatic and then usually they will go away. But that's usually the natural instinct of these folks. Don't offer a scientific explanation for these reprehensible acts. Thirdly, providing a datum at the individual level that is contrary to a fact that holds true at the population level is sufficient, according to detractors, to falsify a given evolutionary principle. What does that mean? Let me put it simply. It is a fact that men are bigger than women. That's a biological fact. But there are endless women that are bigger than men. All of the women who play in the WNBA, every single last one of them is taller than me. That does not falsify the fact that men are taller than women. So if I say, evolutionarily speaking, here's the adaptive reason why men would prefer, on average, to mate with young nubile women than postmenopausal women. Somebody in the audience will put up their hand and say, but my Uncle Joe is dating an older woman, Aunt Jenny. Oh, gee, Darwin is dead. Let's go back to the drawing board, right? <laughs> it, it's not, but again, it's a cognitive trap. They think that if they identify that, quote, black swan, the Darwinian edifice has collapsed. And then the fourth one, which I'll spend much of the rest of today's lecture on, and it's the one actually that irks me the most because it is the one that is typically levied by otherwise sophisticated academics. And that is, you'll get somebody say, well, evolutionary psychology is just a bunch of just so storytelling. You're just coming up with these really cute post hoc stories. It is the exact opposite to that that evolutionary scientists do. And that's what I'll spend much of the rest of today's lecture talking about. So before I do that, some of you may have heard that men have an evolved preference for women to have an hourglass figure. And just for those of you who might want to know what is the preference of women, uh, men prefer a waist-to-hip ratio of 0.7. Women prefer a waist-to-hip ratio in men of 0.9. So think about the uh, male Olympic swimmer. That's the ideal body type for a male. And the hourglass figure is the ideal body type of a woman. And there are all sorts of evolutionary reasons for it. Now, let's see if this is a just-so story or whether I could build for you, now here, bear with me as I say a very fancy term, a nomological network of cumulative evidence. This is an epistemological approach where you collect data from many, many different disciplines, many different conceptual frameworks, many paradigms, many data sources, each of which adds more evidence in support of your scientific position. 
Darwin did it without calling it nomological network of cumulative evidence. Darwin did it in Origin of Species, right? He systematically collected data from a very broad range of sources in making his argument for natural selection. Jerry Coyne, who's sitting here, did a similar thing with his book, Why Evolution is True, right? It's not through one datum, it's not through one experiment, it's not through one data source that you arrive to the unassailable reality that this is a incontrovertible truth, it's you collect a wide body of data. So let's use this approach for two examples. One, a scientific one, and I'll use another one from geopolitics. So in the middle of this nomological network, is the statement, men's evolved preference for the hourglass figure in women is an adaptive preference. So let's see now if I could systematically convince you of that by showing you evidence from many different sources. So let's start with the top box, in the center top box. So theoretically, this makes perfect sense because we know that for sexually reproducing species, they would have evolved certain preferences through sexual selection that confer reproductive advantage, right? Mating preferences don't arise mysteriously. The, the, the female crab that loves a male crab with a big claw, she didn't learn this by watching Hollywood images. She didn't learn this through Elle magazine. There is an evolutionary reason for that. There is no reason to suppose that a similar mechanism doesn't exist for humans. So from a theoretical level, we could easily understand how sexual selection would result in mating preferences for both men and women. So from a, from a theoretical perspective, we're good. Let's kind of go through uh, clockwise all of these different boxes. The hourglass preference has been elicited using a very broad range of methodologies. Paper and pencil tasks, eye tracking methodology, brain imaging studies, so you could give men uh, different images to look at, and then you put them through a, a fMRI, and then you look at which parts of their brains are, have a particular neuronal activation pattern, and what you'll find is that the hourglass figure will el elicit greater activation in the pleasure center of the brain. So we've got paper and pencil studies, we've got eye tracking studies, we've got brain imaging studies, we've got studies of the types of cosmetic surgeries that women do across different cultures. They always try to replicate that hourglass figure. So now it's starting to look like it's not just so storytelling. It's starting to look like we're actually quite careful about how we construct our arguments. But let's go on in case you're not yet fully convinced. We could look at cross-temporal data in the modern era, so you could look at analysis of Playboy centerfolds and Miss America spanning many decades of the 20th century, and you could see that the women who win typically will have uh, exactly those morphological measurements. Okay? If that doesn't convince you enough, those preferences have been elicited. Uh, we, evolutionary psychologists usually don't do a study simply with their undergraduates at Ohio State. Because they're typically looking at human universals, they will go out into the field and collect data from across cultures. So you could go to the Yanomomo tribe in the Amazon and show that they have very similar morphological preferences for women, despite the fact that they don't share any of our cultural realities. Right? And so those preferences have been replicated across a very broad range of cultures that are otherwise extraordinarily different from Western cultures. Now, if that's not enough, skip the, uh, please skip the one that's at the bottom center for a second, because that's the clincher. Let's go on. Cross-cultural and cross-temporal data from art and classics. So you could take uh, statues from ancient Greek, Greece, from Greco-Roman period, from India, from Africa, spanning several millennia. You could take uh, Jomon figurines, and you could do a content analysis of those figures, and they tend to correspond to the hourglass figure. Is that looking like we're waving our hands with just so stories, or does it look like there is an unbelievable amount of evidence? Let's keep going. I've done a study with, in 48 countries online. I, let me tell you the background. I had a student, an undergraduate student, who had taken my course who wanted to be my, art, my research assistant. He came to me at the, after the course and said, hey, I'd like to hang out with you this summer. Can I do some research with you? At the time, I didn't have any uh, research funds. 
I said, well, if you work with me, it'll have to be pro bono. He said, no, 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 I don't care. I just want to get research experience. So I thought about a project for him to work on, and after about a week or so, I went to him and I said, how would you like to surf porn sites for a couple of weeks as a research project? <laughs> to which he answered, I love you, Dr. Sad. <laughs> Basically, what, what I asked him to do is to go on online uh, escort sites from many different countries. That's one of the things that the internet provides you, is this ability to collect cross-cultural data very quickly. And I asked him to simply code what do they typically advertise? They give you their name. Of course, it's likely a fake name. They give you a photo. They give you uh, their height, their weight, and their waist to hip measurements. And so he coded 48 different countries that couldn't be any more different. And not surprisingly, it comes out to almost exactly the number that you would expect. Usually, we say it should be between 0.68 to 0.72, the waist to hip ratio. The average across the 48 countries was 0.72. I mean, exactly right on. Okay. Uh, there's been also studies looking at how much fees men pay for online escorts. Their fees go up the more their hourglass figure, I mean, the closer they are to an hourglass figure. Let's go on. If this is an adaptive preference, you'd have to say, well, wh so wh what, is, what is the advantage? What is the evolutionary advantage? Well, it turns out that women who have that waist to hip ratio are on average healthier, are on average younger, are on average more nubile, are on average more likely to conceive and carry a, a, a pregnancy to completion. That's based on medical data and on, an, on, and on epidemiological data. It's not hand-waving, it's not fancy storytelling. I just sit down in my office and I make up stories, right? It's based on a lot of accumulated evidence. And then now I'd ask you to go to the bottom center one. This is the clincher because just that data would be sufficient to argue for this innate preference. This study has been done on congenitally blind men. So these are men who have never had the gift of sight. Now you might say, well, how do you elicit preferences from blind men? You do it haptically. You do it through touch. So you take different mannequins, you have the congenitally blind men touch those mannequins, and guess which preference they go for? The hourglass figure. So does it look like all of this evidence that I've provided you suggests that it is just so storytelling? No. The ones who usually levy that argument are advertising only one thing. They know nothing about biology, and they know nothing about evolutionary psychology. I'm going to do the exact same exercise for another uh, ideological position from geopolitics in a second, so bear with me. But what I wanted to do next is take a quote from the great JBS Haldane. For some of you who might know him, a few in this room might know him. He was an evolutionary geneticist who was also very well known for having these great quips. He was a very quotable guy. This is actually my favorite quote of his because it perfectly captures my own scientific career. If I, ever, if I were to ever write a scientific autobiography, I would just have to have this quote as the whole book. That's it, that's, that's the quote. So he basically said that when scientists are faced with a new idea, they go through four cognitive stages. Stage one, this is worthless nonsense, this is bullshit, this is garbage. As the paradigmatic defenses start to fall, well, this is an interesting but perverse point of view. Thirdly, well, this is true, but quite unimportant. Who cares? So, so you're showing that consumers are biological beings. Who cares? And then fourth, oh, I always said so. I always loved your work, Professor Saad. Right? Now, the beauty of this is I still have emails. I'm an, I'm an email hoarder. And so I still have emails from colleagues who wrote to me 12 years ago when they were in stage one, but now they've invited me to their university when they're in stage four. Now, I'm too, I'm too polite to remind them of their progression through these four stages. Uh, sorry? That's so PC of me. That's, right. That's just being polite and gracious. Uh, so, and the reason, and I don't say this again to be gleeful and so on, but it's that I truly believe that science is an autocorrective process, right? If you truly believe that the evidence is in your favor, just pull up your socks, work hard, accumulate the evidence, and hopefully will be shown to be correct. So now let's go on from a 
uh, applying this, these nomological networks in the scientific context to now applying it in a geopolitical context. Next, I show you six people who regrettably are profoundly afflicted with OPS. They're some of the grand OPS sufferers. We have Chancellor Angela Merkel. We have what we affectionately refer to him as shiny pony or hair boy. <laughs> Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. My God, does he have beautiful hair. <laughs> we have Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, David Cameron, and uh, George Bush is on that list. Now, you might say, what, what, how is their OPS manifesting itself? Uh, not that I want to take any long discussions now from the audience, but does anybody want to give me a one-word answer to my question? No, it's more specific. It, shh, shh, not Islam. Redacted. Redacted, yes. So when you ask each of these giants of reason, uh, what is causing daily attacks across, I took the effort here to write for you 67 countries where there have been terror attacks. These 67 countries could not be any more different from each other. I won't read it for you. Uh, it, it will actually have a lot greater effect if I read them. They, they vary on every possible metric that you could think of, but they seem to have one root cause to all of the attacks that are happening in these 67 countries. But apparently that cause hasn't been found yet. What we have found are, I listed here for you, I won't read you all of them. Now some, some people actually think that I'm engaging in typical GAD, they call them GADisms. I'm engaging in satire and hyperbole when I write these. These are actual causes that otherwise sophisticated people have come up with to explain these terror attacks that happen on a daily basis. Beard bullying is one. So the San Bernardino attack was potentially due to the fact that the guy was bullied for his beard. Uh, lack of art exposure causes terrorism. So in Molambique, in the suburb of Brussels, uh, how could you expect these guys to not go off to Raqqa in Syria and behead people when they're not export, uh, exposed to Chagall and Degas? I mean, it's a natural progression, right? <laughs> So it's due to male bonding, it's due to uh, uh, adventure seeking, it's due to climate change, it's due to build nice solar panels, it's due to all sorts of reasons, but it is certainly not due to one particular cause. That would be simply racist and bigoted to say so. So let's see if I could construct a nomological network. This is in the abstract, so we're not targeting any particular religion. God forbid that we would do that. <laughs> So instead, what we're going to do is we're simply going to ask the abstract question, is religion X peaceful? We don't have to engage in platitudes. We don't have to engage in politically correct discourse. We could simply build the nomological network, as I did before in the evolutionary psychology context, where I would simply try to identify as many sources from as varied a range of disciplines to see if I could answer this question. So let's do that exercise for is religion X peaceful or not. So we could look at historical data. So if you look at the center top uh, box, you're not seeing, is it, is it good now? Okay. Okay, is it good now? Okay. So. Uh, so if you look at historical, so we could do an analysis of the number of people that have been killed by adherents of X in the name of X since, since its founding. Examples, example, wars of conquest to spread the faith. So we could know very clearly whether Jainism has yielded more deaths than Christianity. We don't have to guess that. There is data that tells us whether that we, could, we could posit a hypothesis and test this. Let's go on. If you go to the right top curve, uh, uh, figure or box, we could do a content analysis of the canonical text. What does that mean? Content analysis is a scientific tool that is typically used by social scientists who, that are trying to study archival data. So if I'd like to quantify the content of a text, how would I go about doing that scientifically? And so here you use a technique called content analysis. So you could take text 
and establish how often in that text is brotherly love uh, condoned? How often in that text is plurality condoned? How often in that text is genocidal hatred of the Jews condoned? Uh, I just came up with that example randomly. I'm, I don't have any particular <laughs> religion, so please don't think that I'm targeting any particular religion. Now, there is a physicist, a former physicist, Bill Warner, who's been on my show, who after he retired as a professor of physics, has dedicated his life to that approach. He's got a center called the Center for the Study of Political Islam, where he does content analyses of the Old Testament, of the New Testament, of the Quran, of the Hadith, of the Seerah of Muhammad, of uh, Mein Kampf. So you give him any book and he'll do the content analysis for you. And then you could then determine whether a particular text is peaceful or not. We don't have to guess. You could go to government lists of terror groups. For example, Canada has its public safety uh, list, which includes all of the groups that are listed as terror groups by Canadian government. There's a similar group by the US Department of State's foreign terrorist organization list. And you could go through that list and see if there is any sort of theme that comes out at you. Are they largely communists? Are they largely rooted in Latvia? Are they Romanian? Do they have any particular, any rubric that you could place them under, the great majority of them? You could look at the plight of religious minorities. So for example, you could do a longitudinal analysis, this is what historians do, of how well religious minorities fare uh, in the countries where X is the majority religion. You don't have to guess this. You could go and find out how do, the answer to this question. There is data that answers that question for you. You could look at global surveys. So for example, Pew surveys, they track people's attitudes and behaviors toward foundational values of secular and liberal societies. So you could know whether Romania has values when it comes to women's rights or gay rights or the rights of religious minorities or freedom of speech, whether Romania has uh, scores differently on these values than uh, Yemen. And we could get to the bottom of that. There isn't, we don't have to guess, okay? Uh, global patterns of Jew hatred, for example, the Anti-Defamation League comes out with a survey where they track the global, global scores of Jew hatred across a wide range of countries. We could see if there is any pattern that sticks out at us. We could look at databases of terror attacks. So for example, the University of Maryland has a global terrorism database where they literally list all the terror attacks. And so we could there see whether the KKK our white Christian extremists are the ones that we should be most worried about as a recent guest on my show explained to me. Or we could look at things like the Religion of Peace website that has tracked over 30,000 terror attacks and they have a very conservative methodology for determining what constitutes a terror attack or not. They have over 30,000 since 9-11 alone spanning endless countries. Or if, you, if you're too lazy to go through those, you could look at a less encompassing list, just go to Wikipedia and see if there's any pattern that emerges for you. And then finally, if you look at the top left-hand corner, you could look at contemporary FBI data. You could do an analysis of FBI terrorist lists to see whether the top, say, 30 or 40, I don't remember the exact number, whether those guys share any uh, underlying commonality, whether we could group them in a particular rubric. Similar analysis could be done for government no-fly lists. So I've shown you here historical data, longitudinal data, survey data. Uh, you could, uh, I forgot to mention, you could look at data from global indices, for example, uh, you know, broad range of well-being, freedom scores, equality metrics to see how different countries score on all of these different well-being indices and see, for example, if secular liberal democracies on average score higher than religious autocracies. We could see that, we could test that using all of the standard tools of hypothesis testing that all of us in this room know. So we don't have to succumb to political correctness, we don't have to succumb to uh, endless progressive platitudes. We could use, in this case, nomological networks to absolutely establish with incontrovertible certainty that this statement tends to be veridical. So what are the takeaways from today's uh, lecture? So I started with two positions. Evolutionary psychology is BS. That's the detractor position. 
And I showed you how, uh, for one particular example, that's simply not true. All that evolutionary psychologists do is they try to use the scientific method to understand how the human mind would have evolved. So if the evolutionary biologist uses it to study the evolution of the tail of the salamander, there is no epistemological reason why those tools are somehow not applicable to the study of the human mind. If anything, we've got endless data sources to study the evolution of the human mind. So, and then the second thing is, I looked at the position, you know, Islam is peace, it has absolutely nothing to do with terror. By the way, I hate to have to give this politically correct preface, uh, arguing that a religion is indeed one that promotes violence to others doesn't imply that we are attacking individuals. As somebody who grew up in Lebanon, who was raised in Lebanon, whose La Arabic is my mother tongue, who escaped execution in Lebanon, both the guys who wanted to kill us and the guys who saved us are Muslim. So it's not as though every single Muslim is mean and it's not as though every single Muslim is lovely. They come with the exact same distribution as the rest of us. But to argue that Islam might promote greater cruelty to animals than Jains is not something that is difficult to argue because we know that when Jains walk, they walk with a broom to clear, uh, you know, lest they might walk on a ant. So the contents, the codified context, content, contents of a religion is something that is perfectly within the purview of a rational thinker. So the mind viruses associated with tribal mindsets, ideological dogma, political correctness, superstition, and other sources of faulty thinking can solely be cured via the appropriate vaccine of logic, reason, and science. And then the last point I mentioned, although this is not a talk about freedom of speech, as somebody who is in academia, who is seeing sort of the daily encroachment on our ability to speak freely, things that we have taken for granted, how slowly these are being eradicated, I should remind everybody in this room that freedom of thought, freedom of inquiry, and freedom of speech are absolute non-negotiable elements of any civilized society. Thank you very much. So I bet there's no questions, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> If, uh -oh. if you don't mind, if, if, I, if I could just indulge myself for a second. In terms of the hourglass study, uh, how do you, um, not modify, but how are you aware of making that as double blind as possible in terms of searching for the answers you might want in terms of the data? Uh, it, uh, is it, how, is it, how is it formulated? So it's, it's so? not one study, right? So what right. this nomological network shows you is a endless number of studies coming from completely different paradigms, okay. spanning every possible culture, every, every possible methodology, all of which converge to the fact that men have this evolved preference. So it's not a question of double blind or not, it's not one right. study, it's an endless number of studies. But in terms of analyzing that data, if you have a predisposed notion, can you, can you data mine to fulfill what you're looking for ahead of time? If, if you have the predisposed notion that there's no. this preference for hourglass. So, for glass. example, let's take the example where I got my RA to uh, code all the measurements. Right, right, right. right? Yeah. He, he collects all that data. I get the scores of the average waist-to-hip ratio, and I do a statistical test that tells me, is the average across the 48 countries within right. the range or not? Okay. If it isn't, the hypothesis has been has disproven. If it is, then it's fine. So, the, okay. so there is absolutely, epistemologically, it's perfectly falsifiable. That it is not, that, that it wasn't falsified is simply because it is true. It's not because epistemologically right. it's unfalsifiable. It's because it happens to be true. Okay. I guess my only concern is, is that if he's searching through those websites with the predisposed notion of looking for figures which will match the the. He's not. He's, he's, he's coding all the data. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, great, great. Okay, where do we start here? Let's, you know what, let me go to the back because I've been up front for a while, so let's go right back here. I'm just interested um, how you might deal with the student um, of yours who's taking a course who might want to be preferred to be called, say, Samuel instead of the, the name their parents gave him, Sarah, or be called the pronoun Zim instead of him, um, how you would deal with that? Because I'm, I'm somewhat, um, I know of, the, of Jordan Peterson. Yeah. You might, you, I'm sure you're familiar with Jordan yeah, Peterson. Yeah, he was on my show. He's a good friend of mine. Yeah. Um, 
And as a professor myself, I have a position on this. I was just interested what your position with a student sure. who would like to be called something other than what's on the roll sheet or something. Sure. Look, I think that we, if we're decent people, if we're empathetic people, then we have to listen to each idiosyncratic case. And as that student comes to me in my office says, here's my situation, I listen empathetically, and hopefully I can cater to his, her, or xer, or xi, or z they. And, and I would do that if I can. What I object to is the government saying that it is now illegal for you to not do so. So what Jordan Peterson is saying is, I mean, imagine how Orwellian it is that if I don't enunciate your nonsensical gender pronoun, right? These are not accepted. They, they, they are literally made up pronouns, right? If you don't say what I tell you to address me as, then you could potentially be liable of a hate crime under Bill C-16. That seems to be extending the, the, the power of the government beyond what probably most of us in this room would find uh, you know, appropriate. So I think we should start off with the position of being empathetic. There is such a thing as gender identity. People, people think when I satirize this that I'm arguing that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm laughing about, not at all. What, I'm, what I am satirizing is this idea that, for example, I had a student, I gave a talk at Wellesley College, which is a, a cesspool of social justice warriors. <laughs> Okay. This was in 2014, so this is before, so I was probably the first guy to be exposed to this gender pronoun stuff. At the end of my talk, a student came up to me and said, so do you, do you not think that it is appropriate for a professor at the start of every class to pull all of his or her students, if I could assume we are binary, uh, and, and ask each student what he or she wishes to be you know, identified as? I said, do you really see this as an optimal way by which society would function? So if you were to go to a gynecologist's office, should the secretary there assume that the patients who walk in self-identify as female, or should we also poll them? Maybe their gender identity is contrary to their biological sex. She said, no, but that's an extreme case. My point was that it's overboard to force us to use certain pronouns. Just be sensible, be decent, be kind, be empathetic, but don't have government telling me what I should say or not say. Does that make sense? Here's one. Um, I, are you at all cautious in your use of government data? And, and Am I at all what? Cautious in your use of government data. Now let me explain what brings this question up. So you're talking about the second. The, this, well, when the, you were talking about the, the, religion, the Muslim yeah. religion thing, and, and some of your data was, okay, governments drew, draw these conclusions. Now, I came of age in the 1960s, all right? And um, during my draft physical, you know, they gave me a list of subversive organizations, and I had to sign a statement that I hadn't been a member of any of these subversive organizations. And being the curious fellow that I was, I read the list <laughs> very carefully. And it basically told me who our government didn't like at that time. There was a shocking number of radical Jewish groups on this list that I had to say that I had never been a member of. Now, today that list would be a lot of Muslim groups would be on this list. And so how trustworthy is government data and are we not dealing with political bias when you include government data in right. your list of evidence? Right, thank you. Uh, let's suppose that I concede that there might be governmental bias, which I'm not, but let's suppose I do. What what this nomological network of cumulative evidence approach does is it tries to protect against what you're saying. Because what it's doing epistemologically, it's saying I'm going to protect myself against any possible biases by precisely looking for as varied a number of data sets from as many a number of paradigms and a number of theoretical approaches that all seem to point to the exact same final conclusion. That's exactly the idea. That's why you build these nomological networks. It would be quite extraordinary if it were that all of these data sources stemming from unbelievably different paradigms are all converging to the same thing because of chance or because because of bias. So that's how you get around that. So even if I were to concede that box two is bias, uh, biased and suspect, I still have endless other boxes that resu re result into an incontrovertible truth. Uh, 
Regarding your second test. My second? Uh, Islam. Yeah, this one. Do you think six... I didn't say Islam, by the way. I said religion X, so you, right. you said Islam. Religion that, X. That's, in my view, that's very bigoted. Even better said. for my question. Do you think that six or 700 years ago, Christianity would have passed that test? Uh, let's not stop Ted Bundy today because there was a serial killer in the dark ages that also killed people. Who cares? Today, there's a reality that this is what we're facing. Is there a monopoly from religion X? Of course not. Uh, there are endless other ideologies that have imparted violence and hatred on people in all sorts of ways since time immemorial. No one can test that. There is nothing unique, monopolistic about Islam, right? So yes, if I were to build a nomological network of Christianity 600 years ago, I could have probably come up with some pretty nasty conclusions as well. But okay, so what? Uh, okay. <laughs> no, the reason, the reason I say it this way is because this is what is known in internet memes as meh, but the Crusades, okay? Uh, which basically is anything you say, somebody says, but come on, what about the Crusades? It, it's just, it's profoundly idiotic, right? Uh, never mind that the Crusades were a response to hundreds of years of aggression from religion X. It was a response. But so what? So a thousand years ago, other folks did nasty things. What, how does that help us today? Who cares? I wasn't asking to get your Islam off the hook. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, I, th I thought that's what you were doing. No, no. I I it, but you, you, you're absolutely right that we... But they're not the same hook. Uh, uh, if you go to see your physician and he says person A is overweight because they're overweight by 20 pounds. They're overweight. Person B is overweight by 200 pounds. Both have been put under the rubric of overweight, but we've evolved a brain that can discriminate between quantities. 20 is less than 200. Therefore, even though both religions might be violent, that doesn't mean that they happen to be equally violent, whether now or ever. Jainism has been less violent than Christianity. That's a fact. <laughs> I just wanted to know if they both fall under that diet. <laughs> uh, today, no. Today, no. Okay. Um, so at my college, uh, I often come across um, the argument that masculinity and its, uh, its cultural form well, so, so that the cultural form of masculinity is what is causing the um, increase of violent crimes, or not the increase, but the, the higher rate of violent crimes among men. Um, and it, it's often argued that that's a cultural uh, phenomenon. And I was wondering if you have an evolutionary psychological uh, explanation for why the majority of violent crimes. So first, my smirk should give you a, yeah, a sense it, <laughs> of what I think of that explanation, right? Okay. Uh, that's, that, I, I, I don't have any. Um, right, right. For, that, I just that, that falls know. under the <laughs> toxic masculinity thing, right? Uh, evolutionarily speaking, the position is it's actually, there's a term for it. It's called the young male syndrome, right? It, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson, who are two of the pioneers of evolutionary psychology, have documented cross culturally, cross epoch, cross uh, you know, human universal that young males have a predisposition for violence. If you want guys to end up being less violent, let them grow, let them age. Testosterone drops, they become less violent. That's true of the Yanomomo tribe, it's true of the Hadza tribe in Central Africa, it's, drew, it's true of Detroit in the 1950s, and it's true in 200 years in LA. Uh, I mean, there are reasons for that. I mean, testosterone would be one, that's a proximate explanation. But from an ultimate explanation, there are also reasons why men would have evolved through sexual selection to be more risk taker, more aggressive, more violent. And so there are very clear evolutionary explanations, yes. And it's got nothing to do with cultural indoctrination. That's complete bullshit. We have time for one more right over here. There is a march on January 21st of the million women because women feel they are not being recognized properly. I'm asking you, do you have a study about men and their characteristics sure. equal to the one that you did on yeah, women. Absolutely. So I've done studies looking at both 
uh, male-based behaviors and female-based behaviors. I'll give you two examples. Uh, so I did a study a few years ago with one of my former graduate students where we looked at what happens to men's testosterone levels after they drive either a fancy Porsche in downtown Montreal or a beaten up old sedan. Uh, so we measured salivary assays that allows us to measure the testosterone level. And we did it in a public setting where everybody could see that I'm a winner or a loser. Uh, and we did it in a semi-deserted highway. And not surprisingly, as probably everybody in this room would uh, predict, uh, you put men, or certainly young men, uh, but probably even older men, in a, in a Porsche, uh, then their endocrinological system responds and their testosterone levels go up. This is why I'm trying to convince my wife now that I need to buy a Maserati. <laughs> because as a, as a older male, you know, it's hormonal replacement therapy to get the Maserati. Uh, for women, on the other hand, we've done studies. I did a study with one of my other uh, graduate students where we tracked women's uh, consumatory behaviors across their menstrual cycles. And so I'll, I'll talk about one part of the study. So for example, their beautification practices, how they dress, how they beautify themselves, turns out to be perfectly correlated to where they are in their menstrual cycles. When they are in the mid-cycle, in the ovulatory phase, that's when they engage in the most amount of sexual signaling. And that's exactly what you would find in countless other species that engage in similar sexual signaling. So I've done studies both on men, on women. That I, I don't care. I just look at the biological bases. And physically for men, what have you discovered? Physically for men, what? So there are. So it depends. It depends what. It depends what you're talking about exactly. So, for example, the waist to hip ratio, as I mentioned, it's 0.9. So later when you're in your hotel rooms, you could all check whether you, you follow 0.9. Uh, for example, facial, facial features, there is something called the CAD versus the DAD. CAD is a guy that has very clear testosterone markers, whereas a DAD is somebody who's got softer features, more nurturance features. Well, it turns out that the exact same woman will have a switch in her preference depending on where she is in her ovulatory cycle. When she is in the maximally fertile phase of her, of her cycle, she prefers CADs. In other points of her cycle, she prefers DADs. Here's an example of a study that would make probably everybody in this room go, God damn, wow, that's interesting, right? There's nothing unfalsifiable about this. There's nothing just so storytelling. We see this exact same phenomenon manifest itself across endless species, where there is a clear strategy as to how males and females within that species make mate choices. Suddenly, when you apply the exact same epistemology to human mating, you are a bullshit Nazi guy. And, and it is very frustrating because it just delays progress because all of the defenses against evolutionary psychology are always rooted in ideology, right? We, we started off by talking about departures from reason. There's almost never a very sound scientific argument against evolutionary psychology. It's always rooted in someone's pet ideology being ruffled by evolutionary theory, right? So the religious folks hate evolutionary theory for clear reasons. The postmodernists, similar. The radical feminists, similar. So it's always rooted in ideology, never in science. I think that's a great way to end this. I know there's tons of questions, and, and if you're okay, we can probably continue the conversation sure. outside. Uh, a round of applause, please, for God Saad. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. It is some tough stuff to think about sometimes, and we really have to, we really have to remember why we're here, to hear everything and to think about it and see what we got. So 